Imagine that you've been training almost all your adult life to become a plastic slash cosmetic surgeon. And then you get a job offer at the Mecca of cosmetic surgery, Beverly Hills, Kardashians, reality shows, high priced job. But what happens? You find out that you don't like what you're doing and you decide to throw away that job offer. In fact, you decide to get out of medicine altogether with no backup plan. Sounds a bit crazy, right? Well, it happened. You'll find out how this former cosmetic surgeon has now launched a business where he helps a special type of physician, and it's a cause greater than himself, and he's loving every minute of it. Hear his story on this episode of Bootstrap MD. Welcome again, everybody. This is Dr. Michael Ming with Bootstrap MD. And as you can tell, I'm really excited. We have a guest live here in the compound slash studio <laughs> right here in San Diego, uh, my friend, Dr. George Wong. And George and I, we've been known each other for a few years. Like myself, he's finally ready to admit that he is a physician entrepreneur. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Wong, uh, George, and we've, uh, we've done an event together where we've, we've worked with doctors who are entrepreneurial, and he had, really has a interesting story. Um, George is a surgeon, a uh, surgeon by trade, plastic surgeon, who in 1995 had his own practice, and because of things that happened, different things that occurred, he actually left his practice and... I'm not going to spoil your story, but it was almost near bankruptcy before deciding to begin a new uh, transition in his life, and he got involved in business consulting and, and business coaching, and he has a very excited new venture that he's doing. He's actually going to be working with other physicians in that realm in terms of consulting and, and financial and marketing, but I'm not going to get too much ahead of myself here. First of all, George, I want you to welcome you to my uh, abode here. I had to uh, make sure that uh, after this, we're going to do like those mind wipes so you don't know the address is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's really, really important. Well, they helicoptered me in blindfolded. That's, that's so. right. That's <laughs> right. There. Uh, but really excited that, that you're in town here in San Diego and you took the time on your, your busy schedule. Just got, a, just got back from Disneyland. Yep. Is that right? Right. Yeah. So you checked out the new Star Wars. Uh, excellent, yes. Excellent, and you live to tell about it, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to, the reason why I had you on is, is you have a very unique story, uh, is that, uh, you know, I've had other doctors here on the show, they've got very interesting lives and, and very interesting paths that they led them to, to do something else mm -hmm. uh, besides uh, what often they were trained for. And what was interesting to you, from hearing your story is you were a surgeon and you left practice, but you didn't have any type of backup plan. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah, I was the backup plan. You were the backup <laughs> plan. So, so tell us your story here. Yeah. So, well, I, I, I wanted to become a plastic surgeon since the age of 17. And, um, I was visiting my brother who was training in neurology at Mayo, which where you did your residency, mm -hmm. which by the way, Mike and I went to the same medical school, just different times. Wayne State University, right. go Detroit. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so I was visiting him. I was, he was doing his rounds in neurology and I was waiting in one of the hospital libraries and I found this giant book, oversized book. And I'd never seen a book that size. It kind of found me. So I had to open it up and it was, um, plastic surgery before and after. It wasn't glitz and glamour. It was reconstructive plastic surgery. And, uh, at the time, I was teaching myself photography, and I put two and two together. I can be a doctor, photography. Oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to become a plastic surgeon. And uh, I didn't know it was going to take me 15 years from that point in time mm. to become a plastic surgeon, which you count, you know, four years of college, four years of medical school, five years of general surgery residency, and then two years of plastic surgery residency. But that's what I did. And then uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Uh, at the age of 32, I was a newly minted plastic surgeon. I started my practice in Seattle and um, in private practice. And uh, within two years, I was nearly penniless, um, hmm. which kind of was predictable because I didn't know how to run a practice. Well, like, where did we learn how to run a practice, Mike, in our training? 
Um, I think the school of hard knocks. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. And that's not a smart thing to do. Um, and so my accountant, this has been 1997, my accountant said, Hey, I think you have a good case to declare bankruptcy. I'm like, what? This is my dream job. Mm-hmm. Turned into my nightmare of my day. And, um, but how is bank- bankruptcy going to help me? It's not. So why don't you teach me something? Which nobody taught me anything. No business advisors had anything good to teach me. And so I said, well, I'll just study on my own. I mean, if I can become a plastic surgeon, I can learn how to run a profitable practice. So mm-hmm. I started studying marketing and selling and money management and hiring and business operations, business systemization. And then at first I was really ticked off that I had to learn these things. Because mm-hmm. here I am, this big wig plastic surgeon and highly trained and Mm-hmm. New, uh, having to learn these things, but I this figured it's beyond me. It's beyond. It's below, <laughs> not beyond. Below, below me. me. <laughs> <laughs> and, but but I said, okay, well, you can complain about it, or you can go bankrupt. And I said, okay, uh-huh. I'll quit complaining. I'll just learn this stuff. And so I, I, I turned the practice around. I did not declare bankruptcy, and um, eventually, uh, my practice was bought by a medical center, and I practiced a few more years. But what happened was. I was doing more and more cosmetic surgery, which mm-hmm. I, didn't, I didn't sign up for that. I don't have anything against cosmetic surgery, mm-hmm. but I didn't really, that's not really what I wanted to do. I wanted to do reconstructive surgery, reconstructive plastic surgery, but it didn't pay as well fighting with the insurance carrier. So I, had to, I ended up doing more and more cosmetic surgery. But I didn't realize what was going to happen is that the more cosmetic surgery I did, yes, the more money I made, but the less happy I was. Mm-hmm. And I remember at one point my wife, said, you know, if you keep going like this, you're going to die an early death. Wow. And I remember, like, that was startling to me. And I remember I snarled, snarled back at her and I said, yeah, you're right. What else am I going to do? And I headed off to the emergency room <laughs> for, wow. for an emergency call. And um, I didn't know what I was going to do. But then in 2003 rolled around, we had our second son. And I was getting more and more unhappy and disillusioned with the way, you know, disease care was going in America. And, um, so I thought, well, okay, we have two young boys and here I am practicing doing something I don't enjoy anymore. And what, am I going to like miss out on their school events and activities and doing a job I don't enjoy any longer? Mm -hmm. And I thought that's not a good way to lead life. So I, I left, I said, I'll figure it out. I left in 2003. I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't have any other revenue streams in place. You know, mentors or anyone no. guiding you? No, family not members, time. nothing like no. that. No, I just said, I'll figure it out. And I mean, I'd, I'd done a lot of courses on personal growth and transformation. I'd done a lot of business courses on marketing and selling. And um, I said, well, if I can become a plastic surgeon, I can figure this out. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I was part of a book before I left plastic surgery is called uh, it was a book mentorship uh, program book publishing mentorship program called create the business breakthrough you want mm-hmm. and I didn't know what I was going to do with the book I was the only non-business person who was part of the book but I started handing it out after I left practice and that's when it was published and a couple of local landscaping companies found out about the book they asked me if I would coach them and I thought sure I'll do that while I'm figuring out what I'm going to do when I grow up And um, then within two weeks of working with them, I realized I knew a lot more about entrepreneurship than I realized Mm -hmm. than I appreciated. So I said, why don't I make that a business? And so I said, okay, great. I'll, um, I'll call people and tell them I'm working. I'm helping entrepreneurs. And after 30 days of calling people, I had zero people who uh, took me up on my offer of a free consultation. Zero. (laughs) I should have been bummed out, but I wasn't for some reason. I don't know why in retrospect. But I said, okay, well, the right people haven't found me. So I said, what's the easiest way? How can I make this easy for people to find me? Right. I said, well, and what can I do that's, that I'm good at that could work quickly? Because my, my practical backup plan was I had a contract waiting for me to do cosmetic surgery in Beverly Hills. And they were calling every two or three days wondering, when am I going to show up? Mm-hmm. I was going to commute from Seattle on Sundays see patients and then operate on the weekends. Yeah, for many surgeons, that's like their dream. I they have Beverly Hills cosmetic exactly, surgery, right? right? Yeah, I, I didn't want to, I would do it to pay the bills, but I, I didn't want no to No TV it. shows and reality TV. Not for was, me. That wasn't you. No. 
not at all, but I would have done it. And, uh, but I, I just believe that I could help fellow entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and, and to avoid the problems that I had. And uh, so what I did is I, I decided I'd do a workshop and I can mm -hmm. speak about almost anything on a moment with, with no notice. I can talk about something or make something up. Because of the uh, track record, or record of having zero people show up at your first book. <laughs> well, this is what happened. This is what I'm talking about. I, I did my first workshop and uh, I canceled it. Oh. I, I, I canceled I scheduled it for four weeks from that date because Beverly Hills is calling and I'm running out of time and money. Yeah. Because uh, I hadn't made money in two years, right? And um, then I'm sure I, your wife was really excited. Oh, she was that. absolutely thrilled. I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And two young boys too. Sure. Right? Yeah. And so I, I decided to do the workshop, and I said, I said, well, all the people. This is 2005. All the people I see have a website, mm -hmm. so I, sh I need to have a website to have let people sign up for the workshop. Mm -hmm. Mike, what was I thinking? <laughs> Who was going to go to the website? I had no list. Yeah. No list, right? But I wasted two weeks trying to do that. And setting up a website back then was a, a lot harder than it is now. Today, you can hit a button and it just goes oh, automatically, yeah. right? Not back then. Mm -hmm. So I wasted time. The most I could do was put up a PDF flyer of my workshop. And after two weeks, I canceled. Two weeks before the event, I canceled it because I thought, oh. I have two weeks to promote it. Who, who am I going to promote to? I didn't even think about that before. Who, who's going to come to the event? So I said, okay, well... I could go to networking breakfast. So I, I printed out a flyer and I took it around. I didn't have real business cards. I took up my flyer to every single networking breakfast and lunch I could find and I invited people to come to the event. So 18 people registered, 19 people showed up and oh. catalyzed by the energy around that event. Within 43 days after that event, I had enough clients, paying clients that I had um, I was bringing in uh, $10,500 a month, oh, like wow. consistently, right? right? It wasn't just one month and no, it was consistent. And then I called Beverly Hills and said, thanks, but no thanks. And so I've been doing that since then, since 2005. I've worked with entrepreneurs from around the world. What was the feeling of actually working with these folks? I, I, it's hard to describe the feeling. It mm -hmm. was, um, I felt like I had found a place where I could really thrive. Yeah. I, Different I, than... Which anything you were doing as a surgeon? No, I mean when I started in plastic surgery, uh, I thought, okay, now I've got, I've realized my dream mm -hmm. to become a plastic surgeon, and I thought, okay, now I'm all set because I've done the hard work, got through medical school and residency. Yeah, I had loans to pay off, but uh, I thought I had arrived, mm -hmm. right? And I enjoyed the work. I love speaking with patients in the room. My nurse had to grab me out of the room, go, you're running behind, next mm -hmm. patient, next room. <laughs> but I love speaking with them. And I do miss that part, right? Um, but I don't miss like the, the worry and the responsibility, like right? someone's life and, or limb. Um, but so, so yeah, I, I, it was a similar feeling of excitement, but uh, I felt relief as well. Mm -hmm. When like, okay, I'm doing something I really am passionate about. Right. I think I'm doing something good in the world. And, uh, and I think I can make a, make a lot of money doing this, um, doing something good. So yeah, it just felt great. Wow. And so you let your license lapse? And I did. It was a mistake. Yes. Yeah. I, I thought that, um, by putting my license on retired active status, I was I'm good. I could turn it back on, yeah. but I didn't know. I didn't have, I didn't have anyone guiding me through this. Right. But so, uh, what I learned uh, years later is that, um, if you are out of practice a certain number of years, you have to retrain. Yeah. And in, in uh, certain states, they have a precedent. Like if, I think in the state of California, if you're out of practice for like two or three years, you have to use some sort of remedial training. Something like that. Right? You just have to. In the state of Washington. You just have to know somebody. Yeah, no, do you? Yeah, I don't want to say anything. And that I don't, I don't have that kind of connection. <laughs> But in the state of Washington, there wasn't a precedent for yeah. that. So, okay. so when I inquired about it, yeah, it was, they just made something up because there was no precedent. And, uh, but uh, that's neither here nor there because I didn't go back to practice. But um, so I, I, my, I decided not to renew my license anymore because what was having retired active status good for? You could practice two or three years for volunteer basis. So, yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no need for that. But what I was concerned about is what about all the, you know, the, the training and education I'd been through. Right. What I didn't know, and again, I didn't have any guides for this, is that um, many of the skills 
and life's experiences I learned from being a medical student, being a resident, being in practice for almost, what, I think nine, nine years, ten years. Um, those, I learned a lot of skills, and those life's experiences cross-transferred to what I do now. I mean, if you think about it, we, we, we as physicians, we operate at a very high level. We're dealing with people's life and limbs, and there are a lot of emotions involved. And yeah, we don't get formal training in how to deal with the emotions, but um, I, I took a lot of training outside of medicine to learn how to be a better communicator, to be a better listener. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you, you would appreciate this, being in uh, primary, primary care as your, your specialty. I had a couple patients who asked me to be their primary care physician. Mm. This is where I am, a plastic surgeon. Right. And at the time, I was like, I was offended the first time yes. this happened. I'm like, I suffered for seven years to be a plastic <laughs> surgeon, family physician. I'm no dudes. gatekeeper. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> plus, I don't know what the latest anti-hypertensive like, drugs are anymore, so you don't want me to do your, your private care. <laughs> but when this happened a second time, I got smart, and I asked, well, how come? Yeah. Why do you want me to be your primary care physician? And the guy said, well, because you listen. I went, What? don't all physicians listen? And he goes, no, they don't. I went, oh, okay. And then I remembered, remembered I had done a lot of training outside of medicine to become a better listener. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's just a fun side story. Um, but that's how this all came out. And, but so my point is a lot of the skills we learn as physicians are cross transfer right. to being an entrepreneur. So do you regret this? Do you regret the um, kind of path you took? I, I, I regret that... I, I love the surgical tinkering part, mm -hmm. but I don't, I, I miss that part. It's like going into the garage and messing around, you know, mm -hmm. but I don't miss the, the, the responsibility gotcha. and the, the political stuff that I saw going on and, and the, the medical legal worries. Right. Don't miss that. So I don't have any regrets about that. Um, I do, I do miss that. You know, I, I think that we're moving into an era where uh, holistic medicine is more widely accepted, mm -hmm. right? And um, I miss kind of like, I, I, I think I missed out on that window because I'm not practicing any longer. Uh, but, but so what I realized in the past year is that I wanted to have a part in that. I just didn't know what it was. And so I started wondering, like, I started having this feeling that, like, who is my audience? Like, it's really been a mixture of entrepreneurs from literally around the world of all industry categories. And I just had this unsettled feeling. I couldn't put a finger on it. And I started wondering, like, who is my audience? At the end of my career, who is my audience that I really made an impact with? Not that I don't help people now, but like, is there a specific audience mm -hmm. that I could be working with? And I didn't know what it was. And for many years, people would ask me, why aren't you working with physicians? And my mm -hmm. reflex answer is, I don't, I don't want to be I think boxed I asked in. That question you, you did. <laughs> about four years ago, you asked me. And I think my, my answer was the same as then. Yeah. And it was like, I, I, I enjoy the spectrum, which right. I did, mm -hmm. right? And I think it was part of, of gaining a lot of experience in, in my own training, yeah. right? But recently, someone asked me that question. In fact, I was in a, at a dinner in San Diego uh, a few months ago, and someone asked me that question. And I, the, for the first time ever, the answer that came out of my mouth, unscripted, was, I don't know. That's a good question. And I went, who said that? <laughs> right. And so I started exploring, you know, working with physicians and what, what, how would I help them? And I first, I thought it'd be physician entrepreneurs. And then I got feedback that that's not a specific enough, enough niche. So I was just pulling my hair out, wondering who that would be. And I realized, you know, when I practiced as a surgeon, I practiced holistically as much as I could, even though mm -hmm. I was criticized for it. Um, and I thought, and that's how we lead our lives. My wife yeah. and I lead our lives. So those two worlds often don't mix. They did, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. right. And uh, and I think that's a part of why I left because it just didn't make sense to me that mm -hmm. we're so narrow minded and fixed minded. Um, so I thought, well, why don't I help holistic physicians to be successful and profitable in practice? And I went, wow. So it's like that eureka moment where the light bulb goes on. Mm -hmm. That's what it was like. And um, because these days, if you want to practice holistically, mainstream medicine doesn't really support that. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's some medical centers that have, say, a naturopath or they have a functional medicine, like mm -hmm. Cleveland Clinic is doing something, sure. you know, pioneering work in that area. It's not, it's the exception yeah, rather than the rule. Right? For sure. 
these days, you and I know most physicians, when they get out of, of training, they're hired, going and get a, getting a job with a big medical center, right? They have a contract. So they're a salaried employee, and that comes with its own downsides. You know, it has its upsides sure. and downsides. But if you want to be a holistic physician, you're going the other way. You're a salmon swimming upstream. You're leaving these medical centers and, right. and the cushy, you know, position that everything's done for you except the medical part. They're trying and to avoid the surgeon. They're, for the most part, right? Yeah. yeah. A patient is, yeah. Exactly, right? But what I'm saying is if you're a physician in, in a, uh, and you want to be a holistic practitioner, you have to leave that, the, the security of having a salary position right. and start your own practice. Right? And then I realized, okay, if that's going to happen, and I believe that if we're going to really improve healthcare, we have to go the holistic route. Mm -hmm. um, and then that means we need more holistic physicians to be successful in their practices. Otherwise, you can't grow the movement, right? And that's where I can help. I can help the physicians uh, to develop their practices and grow it holistically from marketing and selling to business money management. You know, I've developed this whole, uh, co-developed this whole business money management platform and software, and I can help people with their business systems. And I, and I do think holistically. And so I went, wow, that seems like the match made in heaven. Why do I <laughs> help holistic physicians develop their you know, practices holistically. Because what I say is if you're going to help um, your patients with a holistic approach, then your practice, your holistic practice needs to be healthy, right? So that makes, makes sense, right? Yeah, so it made sense. I just had to be emotionally ready for it and that I wasn't emotionally ready to do this until, um, you know, this year. So I want to transition a bit. We're going to talk more about holistic physicians and, and what you're doing, what you're doing to help them. But... I can gather by people who are, are either listening to this on the podcast or watching on YouTube, they're probably saying two, one of two things. They're probably saying, I can't believe he quit his job. Mm. And then what I'm saying is, I can't believe he quit his job. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, you had no backup plan. Um, I gather you don't recommend that approach today <laughs> for someone. No, right? I definitely don't recommend that approach. If yeah. I were to do it again, I probably wouldn't do it that way. But um, I, I, I think with, with rare exception, I mean, in some rare exceptions, you could do that approach. But in general, I recommend for probably 99.9% .9 of physicians yeah. out there, keep your day job and uh, come up with a game plan. Come up with a game plan that is uh, both strategic and tactical, meaning practical, not just high-level ideas, right. that, um, that showcases your natural strengths in terms of how you're wired and uh, minimizes the blind spots or blockers that you might have. And, and work that plan. You don't have to go out and try to hit a grand slam. I think there's a lot of pressure in trying to hit a grand slam. Mm -hmm. I know because I had that pressure. Um, but you also have a, enough motivation right. to go out and hit some singles and string some doubles and triples together in an occasional home run. So, the, uh, so do, while I recommend that you keep your day job and start – working, doing some entrepreneurial testing. I think the downside of it is you may not have the same level of motivation to mm -hmm. keep going. Right, 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 you can right. go, you can always back up and go, oh, it didn't work. Uh, yeah, whatever. I'll try again someday, one day. Right. Right. Or you go, I'm still working on it. And it's like two years later, you're still, you haven't touched it, but you think you're still working on it because you, did, you don't have a fire under your bum that you have to succeed. Right? And now that we're, you know, in the mid nineties is, you know, late nineties has changed. Not as it is today. Mm -hmm. We've got so much information. Yeah. I would gather having a, a mentor, a consultant, you know, into, you were now involved in business consulting yeah. to find someone who's actually doing what you wanted to do. Right. And, and, and let them mentor you and have some type of, Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I would recommend if you're a holistic physician, have, have a guide or a mentor. Yeah. I just didn't have a physician guide at the time. Um, I just had to, I didn't even think about having right, someone right. I mean, I had coaches, but they weren't physicians, right? For sure. Yeah. For sure. So, as you said, things have changed today, and, and you recommend, as you said, to keep your day job. Um, what, what do you think of the atmosphere now is with, you know, we've got, I think, you know, I, I, I decided to leave several years later, but I, for, for the most part, I felt that was by myself. You felt that you were alone. Oh, yeah. Um, there's so much now 
there's groups that talk about side gigs and there is there is different avenues a doctor can make money talk about telemedicine we're talking about non-clinical opportunities yeah, yeah. and there's certainly a lot more opportunities in entrepreneurship and building your own uh, business yeah um be that as it may, it still seems many doctors are reluctant to make that transition. Yep. yep. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. I think one of the primary reasons is we've, um, we've dedicated so much of our lives to becoming physicians. Mm -hmm. And I think that for better or for worse, our egos keep us from making a big significant, significant leap. And, and I think there are so sort of practical challenges because you're probably making a good salary probably uh, have retirement uh, building up mm -hmm. and there are risks involved with leaving for sure. And, um, and I also think that most physicians don't know the first thing about starting their own business. Mm -hmm. You get out of medical or residency. You don't have to deal with that when you sign on with the medical center, you can complain about how it's run, but you still don't know how to run the marketing right. or the selling or the money operations. Right. And uh, so I think that inherently physicians know that they, there are a lot of things they don't know and there are a lot of things that they don't know that they don't know, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a, it's a scary proposition. Now, can, is it possible to get past those hurdles? Of course there are. People mm -hmm. do it, right? But um, it, it takes a willingness to uh, let your ego take a back right. seat. And I think right? that's a big part of it too, yeah. is they don't, they don't know what they need to know, but they... They also don't know, and they may not be willing to ask. Exactly. Well, right. For sure. Yeah. And, and I think it, but, but I think the way to overcome the ego is to say, hey, you know what? By leaving the established or traditional world, uh, I'm going to be able to honor my values. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to pursue living my life and building and practicing the way that I envision it ought to be done, not according to the way the, quote, establishment says it does, does or uh, according to the, quote, medical center policies and procedures that some administrator mm -hmm. puts together or that the insurance carriers dictate. So I think it takes a willingness to honor one's values and respect oneself and to trust that and have faith in one's abilities to take the skills and, and talents and abilities that we've honed as physicians. And I think it's easy to take it for granted because this is a water we swim in. Right, right. And, and it is only for me working with entrepreneurs the last, since 2005, that I realized how many of these skills cross transfer that I even took for granted, that I didn't know going into this, that it would be so helpful to um, have, um, as physicians, what we've done is we've worked with a whole spectrum of people from all walks of life. Right, right. From all states of health and disease and even dying and even diet, and we talked to their families. And uh, we've seen horrific people in horrific condition. And we've seen people in great health, right? And that life experience, we can't take for granted. It's easy to take for granted, but we can't because most people don't have that privilege of, of experiencing life and, and interacting with people in those circumstances. So we've talked about why many doctors don't you know, make, make that leap, They're not, they're, they feel naive, and, don't have much uh, in terms of business acumen. A, a second thing is, is that feeling of, I spent all this time and money training to become a doctor. That's the only thing that I should do. Right, understood. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm sure you felt that way at, at one time. Well, I or? wondered what the heck have I done to myself, uh -huh. right? <laughs> right, at various points, right? But at the same time, if, when I asked the question, okay, you can think that way, George, but if you, do you want to go back? Not really. <laughs> Not with it. I think that I think that as bad as things yeah. are, they're going to get worse yeah. before they get better. And I I don't see. I I can't imagine doing uh -huh. that. Right. But so. But what does it take to really leave? I think it really takes um, a willingness to not know. Yeah. But, and also, too, I think you also get, might get pressure, I know for you, but for me, I got pressure from my family. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, family of doctors, my yeah. mom, just yeah. like, you know, uh, what are you doing? You were, you were, you became educated to become a doctor. Yeah. That's the only thing that you yeah. should be. But I also got a master's degree in public health that, unfortunately, I don't use that. Right. I don't mind epidemiologists. Right. Um, I took O chemistry. I don't know the last time you 
apply organic chemistry to your no <laughs> your your life <laughs> or uh, biochemistry those kinds of things. And you know, there's always people you know um, who end up transitioning to a different career yeah. later in life. Yeah, well, there's no yeah. problem with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. There's nothing. Uh, wrong look with at it. college. Most people are are doing what their their major right. was in college. What's yeah. wrong with that? If you go in the military, you retire after 20 years, you have a pension. People don't say, well, you retired from the military after 20 right. years and did something else. What? Why? Just because you do go down one path doesn't mean you have to stick with that path forever, especially if that path no longer is working for you. Right. It doesn't make sense because if you, stick, if you go down a path because you said, okay, I committed my life to it. I said I was going to do this when I was a 17-year-old kid. Right. Where are you going to end up? You're going to end up unhappy. Right. You're going to end up being miserable, maybe clinically depressed, and you may actually kill yourself. Yeah. Like literally kill right, yourself, right, right, right? right? Because we know physician burnout is a major issue, probably more so now than ever. And I didn't realize this until I was talking to uh, somebody about this. I was in, reading about it that I didn't realize that physicians had one of the highest, if not the highest, suicide rate oh, yeah. amongst the trained right, professions. Right. I didn't know this, right? And um, so, yeah, you can continue to be miserable, but why be miserable? Right. Oh, I mean, if you want to be miserable, choose to be miserable, but don't do it passively. Yeah, and it is, it is surprising. I'm just kidding, by the yeah, way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I know. It is surprising, though, that you know many, many of us decide their specialty based upon a time in their early 20s mm -hmm. and third year medical school, and they might choose it for kind of the most superfluous of reasons, like, you know. Exactly. I mean, in my day, everybody went into emergency medicine because ER was the most popular TV show at the time. Oh, there you go, right. Yeah, exactly. and, or they liked that surgeon because they were nice, so they got honors on that, yeah. or they liked the lifestyle that, that dermatologist drove a cool car, so maybe they could drive a cool car as right. well. Exactly. And then they realized for that period of time, now they're, for the next for a few years, that's the only thing that they can do. Yeah. You don't want to live life of regret, right? No. No. Yeah. So always, you can always have the opportunity, no matter what your family or what others may think of you. Yeah. Um, I know we, we talked about this a, a little bit, but not too much, but when you, when had your bankruptcy, it was an embarrassment, right? Oh. You know, from your colleagues uh, or... Yeah, I was... Um, um, well, this was... So 90, this is 1997, when, and I had been in practice for two years. So yes, all of that. So I was uh, new in town, mm -hmm. didn't have friends and family. I was studying... At the time, it was a longer process to get your plastic surgery boards. You had to be in practice for at least a year. Now they've changed it, but I was studying for my most important exam of my career, which was my plastic surgery boards. And I was going through a divorce at the same time. And my practice was hemorrhaging money. And uh, I was going further into debt. So wow. all these four major like Yeah, those are like... <laughs> yeah, I should have been clinically depressed. I don't know why I wasn't, but I was Yeah, they, I those are like warning signs. It's almost like the cage questionnaire. You've hit like almost everything. <laughs> exactly, right? So yeah, it was miserable. I forgot how we brought, you brought that up. Yeah, yeah that's what it, Oh, so what did it feel like? So it was a big blow to my ego. I felt embarrassed. I felt humiliated. I felt like I had wasted um, like all that education and training just to be, have the privilege or opportunity to declare, to declare bankruptcy. Um, I didn't really like talking to colleagues about it. Uh, they couldn't help me anyways. They were just mm -hmm. ignorant about business as I was. Um, but even if I had been on a deserted island, uh, and no other human beings around, I would have felt about this tall about myself. So mm. my self-esteem right. and sense of worth was pretty much non-existent at that time. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, well, so, you know, obviously it was a tremendous leap and a tremendous, to courage. You may not, you, you talk about it, you don't feel courageous, you said, but it did take courage no. for you to do something like that. Yeah, That's well, it, it was, I, I, sure, you can call it courage, but it was like, okay, do I want to suffer? Am I right. willing to suffer and grind it out for the next 20, 30, 40 years doing work that I don't like doing? Right. It was easier to take the risk right. and honor my values and be true to myself than it was to pretend like I could you know, keep practicing in a manner that just was unenjoyable and unfulfilling. It's, I'm not willing to do that. So you can call that courage. Great. Yeah. But... I just wasn't willing to, to suffer like that any longer. So that gets us to today. 
you know, the world has changed. Mm -hmm. There are a lot more physicians who are open to leaving their career, leaving, you know, leaving the bedside, yeah. non-clinical opportunity yeah. abound. Um, and, and for those, we kind of want to, you know, we're talking some, pretty, some heavy stuff here, kind of want to end in kind of positivity. Yeah. You also agree that this is now an easier time to, to look at different uh, challenges and different opportunities that are out there. I think there are far more opportunities than ever before mm -hmm. and more coming down the pipe. And I think from a technological standpoint, it's far easier to, uh, there are a lot more technological options right. that enable a physician to um, develop a side gig or take on a different career path. Right, yeah. right, right. I, one of the challenges that comes with that is it's harder to choose. Right, right. right. Yeah. Right. And there's more uh, opportunity. We were at a, a, a workshop seminar uh, led by uh, Michelle Majwali. Um, and uh, you, you came in. And one of the things that kind of struck me uh, after we, you were an attendee, I was uh, presenting it there. What you mentioned is, you're around, now you're around other doctors. Yeah. <laughs> and, and in your 15 years of kind of being out on your own, you never really had that opportunity. No, I've, had, I've worked with physicians and other healthcare providers, yeah. but it's onesie, you know, one at a time. It wasn't right. in a big group, right, with multiple breakout rooms going on. And yeah. how did that – tell us about your – you told me, tell me tell the answer about your feelings about you know, yeah. being around other doctors who are kind of like-minded. Right. That. So it was the first time I had the experience that I wasn't alone. Yeah. And, and there have been times where I thought, man, I think I'm going crazy. I must be the only person in the history of humankind yeah. who's having these thoughts and feelings. But, but I, I heard from so many other people, uh, not from just you and I having private conversations, but so many other people sharing similar thoughts and feelings about how they felt frustrated with the establishment, how they tried different things, how, they, uh, how it played with their egos, right? and how they've tried to uh, you know, honor their own values and the paths that they took and the hard knocks they've been through, right? right? right. And it, it felt uh, uh, like a relief to, to recognize that this is a growing movement. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just George back in 95 and mm -hmm. you know, just duking it out and doing the best he could, uh, that there are more and, more and more physicians who recognize we're we have the opportunity to, you know, create a revolution. Right. 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 And great. I, I have a lot of experience. I can contribute to this revolution. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it is a movement. It is know, a movement. It is a movement. And so you left medicine. What year did you complete? 2003. 2003. And I was 2005. Uh, we kind of sound like some old grizzled veterans <laughs> who've been out for a while. It is true. It is an easier time right. now. Uh, there for someone who's, who's struggling just because of different opportunities, the technological advances, as you mentioned. And, you know, uh, I encourage anybody to go to a seminar, a conference where there are like-minded other physicians, you know, not your typical, just you get there for their CME or you like the area that you're at, but go to where you're at, can actually converse. And I do think it's, it's therapeutic to, yeah, to yeah. be around. And, and, and uh, we're in a mastermind group with physician influencers. And, and I, that's one of the, my peaks when we have is these months is to be able to, to talk with other doctors because it can be lonely, yeah. especially in the entrepreneurial world, and let alone be a physician entrepreneur, yeah. uh, to, have these, uh, to have these conversations and to talk about these kinds of things. Um, so tell us now about the holistic physicians and a new, new opportunity that you've been Working out of all those times that we've talked about, why aren't you working with physicians? You, you know, you're a physician. Yeah. You, you understand your struggle. It's good to hear a voice who's who's been there and done that. Um, but tell us what you're, what you're doing now with holistic physicians. How are you? Helping yeah, them? there are a number of things. So I'm working privately with holistic physicians, okay. helping them to. I mean, we do literally take a holistic approach to building their practices, and that means you're looking at the marketing and sales aspects. Where I train them in in business finance, business business money management. As I told you, I had that. And, uh, a software that helps right. people set financial business goals. And not only because of your past, but there's something unique about holistic physicians. As, as you talked about, they're, they're often working for themselves. Yep. They're not working with others. Yep. Uh, they're going into areas that are not, you know, obviously not conventional. There's, exactly. there's no yep. roadmap. Yep. Um, may feel like they're kind of a maverick, you know, in the, in the med medical space. So how do you, 
so tell us again, how, how do you help them? Well, What's I help that? them also with the mindset as well, right? Mm -hmm. And resolving the ego issues and the concerns and the fears about, oh my gosh, well, maybe I should just go back, <laughs> right? And so there is, um, it, it requires uh, being a cheerleader and a champion yeah. for and reminding them of their values and their vision yeah. and, and why they're doing this and reminding them that they have the opportunity to really do something uh, that's fulfilling and helps other people. And, and oftentimes it's usually not their, they're not doing this straight out of residency, right? They, no. They're in a career, uh, maybe primary care, some other type of special needs yeah. for a while and are going out on their own. Um, so that is, you know, very interesting and unique, and, and it's a story that you know you yourself have traveled to, yep. to that you've traveled exactly. uh, yeah. on it again. Yeah. And so you have an association that you're building. Oh yeah, I was going to mention. So yeah, so part of this. So I, I like when you mentioned it's a movement. I think there, we're in the very very early stages of a holistic medical movement, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm glad to be part of that. And so what I what I've noticed is that. And I've done a lot of research on this. There are a lot of societies out there, associations for holistic physicians and practitioners. Mm -hmm. And uh, but what of the dozens that I've looked at, they're typically focused on the science. They're focused on the process, which is great. I think it's great to have that. We need that. Mm -hmm. uh, but what about the business side of things? Mm -hmm. And when I look, there's like an occasional workshop on you know how to market your practice in an hour. Like, right, right, right. right. Not it's work. an afterthought. It's an afterthought. I mean, I guess it's, it's, it's an afterthought, right? That's great. So I said, okay, well, what about the practice? Because I know the struggles I went sure. through. Sure. I mean, I first can. Mm -hmm. in, on an emotional and intellectual basis, right? And I said, okay, well, there's a gap here. And that's what I'm all about is the, the practice side, the business side of the practice, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'm going to start a society, an association. It's called the International Holistic Medical Practice Association. Mm -hmm. And is focused 99% on the business side of the practice, how to make the practice profitable while doing something good for people, right? And so to kick it off, I'm developing, and you and I have had conversations about this, I'm going to kick it off with a summit that, the, the, that will showcase the, um, how to build a profitable holistic practice. And that will, um, I, I want that to help provide awareness to this, International uh, Holistic Medical Practice Association, Association and the Holistic Medical Movement. And this, when is the summit happening? Planning to, uh, to have it go live at the end of September. And it's an online summit. It's, right. an on, it's a virtual summit, yeah. And we'll have individual speakers, but also we'll have uh, panels, live panels as well. And how can they get more information about this? So two things. So um, if you're interested, go to freedompreneur.com, which is my primary mm -hmm. website, freedompreneur.com. But if you're interested in the summit, I don't have anything online yet about it, but uh, send me an email, george at freedompreneurmd.com. You may be great to be a speaker for the event, or if you want to be on the early notification list for the event, george at freedompreneurmd.com. And just so, because there, there's some confusion sometimes with holistic, we've talked about this before, uh, holistic physician, what type of integrative medicine, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and anti-aging to some point, right. a different, or just a physician who may be interested, right? Yes. In, in you know, the whole body yeah. and body mind. Yeah. Holistic means uh, taking a mind-body-spirit approach to mm -hmm. the physical aspect of, the, the, of health and healing and disease. It means looking at the emotional side mm -hmm. of how we heal and don't heal and how disease right. is caused. It means looking at the scientific side from the genetics to the t environmental toxins, right. right? And drugs and drug interactions. Um, so so it, it is, holistic physicians encompass allopathic physicians who are allopathically trained. It encompasses uh, osteopathic physicians and naturopathic physicians as well. Wonderful and yeah. wonderful. Um, so if you want more information, guys, uh, freedompreneur.com or email at George. Um, this has been Wonderful. Uh, maybe a little bit therapeutic for you, my friend. <laughs> right? Um, any last minute advice that you have for, for someone who is maybe in that, in that path or they're, they're not excited about their job and just not getting that drive? They know that they have a calling. They're not sure what it's from, yeah. but they're not ready to make that leap. Right. How do they decide when it's time to make the leap and 
what can you, where should they go? I would, I would do a quick little exercise. I'd take about 10, 15 minutes and write out a listing of all your values. What are the fundamental qualities and characteristics of being human that are important to you? Write those out. One doesn't have to take long. Set a timer. And then after you've written that list, you say, okay, what are the top values? Circle your top five. Right? And then after you've done the top five, the quick exercise is, okay, you ask yourself, okay, how do I honor these values? Can I honor those values doing what I'm doing now? If the answer is yes, great. Keep doing what you're doing. If the answer is no, my, out, my values are not being honored, then the next question is, how do I take the next step to honor those values? And it doesn't have to be a major leap. It can be a small step moving forward. That small step could be getting in touch with me, for example, or it could be uh, researching things online for how to grow your holistic practice. But take a small step, whatever it is, and put it in your calendar that you're going to take consistent steps to move your vision forward. And I mean that. Put it in your calendar. In my mind, if it doesn't, it's not in my calendar, it kind of doesn't exist. So put it in your calendar. That was really, really good. And it was, what's interesting, what you said is, is I usually end my um, podcast with it. I always say, keep moving forward. And somebody asks, well, why do you always keep saying that? And it doesn't have to be a big leap forward. Like you said, it could be five or ten minutes of doing something okay. a little bit closer to your goals. Yeah. You know, whatever that is. If there's something, my thing is, is, and I, I think where we were kind of struggling is we were in a jobs, we were jobs that we just didn't right. like doing. Mm -hmm. And you found a passion, you found an opportunity where you're doing more than just yourself. You know, you're really helping others. You now this holistic physician journey yeah. that, that you started is because you've got a passion that there's something that's bigger than yourself that yes, you need to, exactly. you need to pursue. And yeah. so whatever that is, it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take you have to apply it to new jobs, but it could be, like you said, research it for 10 minutes, mm -hmm. get you one step closer to yeah. your goals every day, doing something a little bit different. And before you know it, just like in a race, yeah. if you keep doing the steps, eventually you're going to hit that finish line. You're going to find out what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, George, again, always illuminating, always great to talk yeah. with you, my nice friend. Life. I look forward to hearing about the summit and uh, what you're doing with holistic physicians. And thank you guys for uh, listening and, and watching this. I really appreciate this. Again, as always, like I said, something each day, do something a little bit to get you forward to your goals, so keep moving forward.